Hi everybody, hope you're well. Uh, today I will read from a book titled Michael Asher, Writings 1973-1983 on works 1969-1979, edited by Benjamin Buclo and published by Primary Information. In 1973, Kasper Koenig, then editor of the press of the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design, proposed that I should publish a documentation of my work for the Nova Scotia series. The projected volume should comprise writings and detailed documentation, photographs and architectural drawings on each individual work that I had completed by the time of publication. I accepted the conditions set forth by this proposal since the book would provide me with an opportunity to document and problematize my production and it would offer a coherent reading of my work that would have remained otherwise isolated and dispersed. From 1973 to 1976, I developed the first written draft while I was teaching and while I continued to produce work. In 1976, Kasper Koenig left the press of the Nova Scotia College to commit himself to different projects, and in 1978, Benjamin Buclo was appointed as the new editor of the press. Prior to his appointment, Benjamin Buclo and I had corresponded on a contribution for the journal that he was editing at that time. We first met in 1976 at the Venice Biennale and we agreed that he would write an essay for the catalogue of my forthcoming exhibition at the Stedelic Van Abbe Museum in Eindhoven. In 1978, Benjamin Buclo proposed the continuation of the book project suggesting that the few initial writings and all future writings should be developed beyond their limits of material description and that they should include elements of a perceptual and theoretical analysis of my work. I agreed to this proposal in spite of the risk inherent in such an approach. Because of the change in approaching the project, the editor had to invest a significant amount of time in the development of the writings. This book is therefore the result of a close collaboration between author and editor. The writings are often the result of a joint authorship. Nevertheless, the reader should note that all proposals for description and analysis that were contributed by the editor were examined carefully until I opted to include or exclude those proposals. Although the reader might expect otherwise, this technique of writing in collaboration is most likely the slowest process, but both author and editor considered it to be the method that would guarantee as precise a documentation as currently possible. In retrospect, I can say that the nature of our working relationship was partly defined by Benjamin Buclos' the critical and historical interest in my practice. His contributions to the formation of this text affected the outcome of the project considerably. In my experience, I do not know of any publication where an artist and a critic have shared authorship to this degree. Our collaboration has been essential for the analysis of the individual works as well as for an understanding of the general historical context. Yet, I hope that the fusion of the two approaches has not resulted in a seamless text, but rather reveals the parallelism that exists within the two enterprises of art production and criticism that are generally considered separate, if not oppositional. As the manuscript was being proofread, Benjamin Buclo and I were still discussing whether to add or subtract writings. Also, due to the circumstances of jointly writing the texts for this book, we had to agree to an artificial cut-off date for the writing and the documentation of my production. It would have meant to delay the publication of this volume endlessly if we had attempted to include every new work that I produced while the documentation was established for this publication. The date that we chose was 1979. Even though the more recent work since 1979 seems less removed in time and more accessible, I would very much hope to publish at a later date a second volume. In the meantime, the reader is encouraged to view the operation of my present work and compare it to the work of this documentation and its texts. This book as a finished product will have a material permanence that contradicts the actual impermanence of the artwork, 
yet paradoxically functions as a testimony to that impermanence of my production. Only those works were included in the documentation that were actually installed uh, at some time in an institutional context of a museum, commercial gallery or exhibition. All proposals or projects that I might have submitted or considered and that turned out to be unfeasible or were refused by the institution for other reasons are not considered to be work and have therefore been excluded from the documentation. Each chapter tries to assemble as accurately as possible the documentation of the individual work or those aspects of it that can be represented in one form or another text, photographs, drawings and architectural plans. Even though this will at best approximate certain aspects of the actual work, I hope the reader will be able to develop a critical examination of the work on the grounds of this material. Benjamin Buchlow wrote, This volume presents the work by Michael Asher from 1969 to 1979, and the descriptions and commentaries on this work that were written by Michael Asher for this book from 1973 to 1983. It is an attempt on the side of the author and the editor to make accessible to readers and viewers the documents of an artistic practice that one could characterize as being both extremely ephemeral and transient and that is, at the same time, among the most concrete and materialist aesthetic productions of the 60s and 70s. Asher's work committed itself to the development of a practice of situational aesthetics that insisted on a critical refusal to provide an existing apparatus with legitimizing aesthetic information, while at the same time revealing, if not changing, the existing conditions of the apparatus. More than any other artist of his generation that I am aware of, did he maintain that stance once it had been defined after the shortcomings and compromises of minimal art had become apparent in the late 60s and conceptual art had revealed its idealist fallacies. When notions such as site specificity or the materialization and the denial to commodify the work had already become myths that were used by the institutions to rejuvenate their legitimation at a historical moment when their liberal humanist public image had come under scrutiny by philosophers and artists alike, Asher's work increased the specificity of its critical analysis of the conditions of aesthetic production and reception with every work that he inscribed into the institutional framework. It is as a result of the radicality of that specific analysis that Asher's work has ceased to exist without any vestige whatsoever. In that respect alone, it differs already from most other work of the conceptual period that objectified itself, after all, in the photo document, the written definition or the archive as art object. If it is one of the paradoxes of this book to transfer from practice to discourse what was defined as a temporally and spatially specific and efficient operation, another one is its attempt to reconstruct the material data of the work as accurately as possible when in fact the work's strategies required a systematic abstention from a quantifiable enduring construct. In fact, one of the ambitions of the author and one of the most difficult and time-consuming tasks in the formation of the manuscript for this publication was the rendering and reconstruction of the actual data. Architectural size, dimensions of areas affected by the particular work, placement, location, etc. which indicated the problems of that transformation that the book tries to perform. It might well turn out to be the most cumbersome aspect of the writings and, on first glance, the least attractive for readers working their way through the accumulation of minutely specified data and measurements of each individual installation. If this condition reflects certainly the author's concern to maintain the material element of his practice even within its transformation into discourse, and it might indicate his relative disregard for the latter, I would all the more emphasize that it is in this rigorous devotion to the materiality of his deconstructive practice that Asher's position might be best understood. 
I might go farther and say that among the many rewarding experiences that working with Michael Asher on this project implied, the most important has been the recognition to what extent of material detail the contemplation and analysis of history and ideology can be and have to be developed in order to generate knowledge through the construction of perceptual models. To put it simply, if the tradition of sculptural production upon which Asher has obviously funded the development of his work could have a meaningful continuation and evolution, and that mode of production could claim authenticity and validity, it would be in that devotion to all the material conditions within which an aesthetic construct is produced and perceived. The book was originally co-published in 1983 by the press of Nova Scotia College of Art and Design and the Museum of Modern Art, Los Angeles, and was printed in two versions. One version was printed in 1500 copies and bare the imprint of uh, the press of Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. The second version, printed on an edition of 500, bears the imprint of both institutions and contains on the inside of the dust jacket documentation of a work by Asher for Mocha. This uh, 2021 book is the facsimile of the second version. Ask for it at your local bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video. Bye.